Okay, welcome. Um, we'll, we'll get going. I'm sure people will join as we go. Um, so we've got a, a big and full agenda today up till 11.30. I'll quickly work through that. My name is Andy Dunn. Um, I am the chair elect for SIWEM trustee board. My, my term starts in July, taking over from Paul Seeley, who's done a you know, great job over the last four or five years. Um, also, I'm the chief engineer at Thames Water. And one of my responsibilities is driving the carbon agenda to make sure that we hit the various deadlines that we'll be talking about today um, and some of the actions that we'll be doing along the way. Um, as, as I said, there's quite a few attendees. We've got 10 minutes. Uh, sorry, there's quite a few panelists. There's a 10 minute slot per person. So we're going to be going through this pretty quickly. Um, need to really sort of thank WRC for sponsoring this. We've got a great attendance coming along and, and with sponsorship from people like WRC, it's been great that we've been able to offer this free of charge um, and sort of really looking for that to, to come through more as we do more of these webinar seminars into the future. Um, it's worth noting that it's, it's COP26 next, next year and uh, we'll be doing a whole load of virtual events around that to be able to support it and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. Um, SIWEM is the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management, for those of you who don't know, um, offering chartership and prof professional development and training for the, the water and environmental industry. Um, last year, we declared a couple of emergencies, one around climate and one around the ecological uh, damage that is happening. Um, the, the climate one is, is really up there, it's in the news an awful lot, everybody's talking about it a lot, which is great. There's, there's been lots of announcements recently, again, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, the ecological emergency is probably less talked about, but it's just as important to make sure that we maintain our, our biodiversity and, and all the, the Earth's nature resilience to make sure that we're better across the world. Um, and so there'll be more about that from SIWEM over the period. Um, before we actually get into the house rules of, of this session, I just wanted to share a bit of a safety moment. It's something that we should all be doing with our meetings and just talking about things. Um, there is a, an obvious safety moment, which I'm not actually going to talk about, but I am going to acknowledge of what happened with our colleagues in, Wes in Wessex Water. Um, our, our hearts and thoughts go out to them and their families and their colleagues and the whole water industry family around that. Um, we are sort of obviously all looking in and attentively in terms of finding out what happened on that and we'll be reacting as we know more, but that's not actually going to be my safety moment, I just wanted to acknowledge it. My safety moment is more around the way that we're all working at the moment um, on screens or virtually a lot more than we used to be. And, and actually we've noticed that there's been quite a lot more eye issues than there have been previously, eye strain, and somebody came up to me um, uh, the other day and said with a safety moment and said that there was a 2020-20 uh, a analogy for how to help eye strain and that's every 20 minutes you look away from your screen to at least 20 meters away for at least 20 seconds and I just thought that was a great little um, acknowledgement to the fact that we're all working a little bit differently screen and eye, eye strain was always there but it just seems to have gone to an order of magnitude more and if we can remember that, hopefully we'll all maintain our eyesight a little bit longer. And uh, as you get older, you do tend to notice your eyes going a little bit as you go. I've certainly been doing that. So that's my, uh, my safety moment on that. Um, in terms of the house rules, uh, we'll be using Slido to, uh, to poll the audience. There's already a poll on Slido. Uh, please go onto it. It's slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com. Very simple. The um, the, the code, there's already a hashtag there for you, but it's uh, NET, N-E-T in capital letters, and then zero as in the, the number. Um, please go on there. You can ask any questions you want to ask through there. You'll be able to do the poll. When we get to the Q&A sessions, of which there'll be two, um, we'll, we'll be able to uh, you know, use the most popular questions. I'll be directing people to the most popular questions. Um, so please also just keep an eye on that and just like the ones that you, you want answered by, uh, by your colleagues. Um, please try not to use the Zoom chat, use uh, Slido instead, because that's where we're going to be sort of driving a lot of these types of aspects. The Zoom chat sort of comes up and flashes in people's face sometimes, so it's better that we could just do it, do it in that way. Um, in terms of the session itself, 
Uh, we're going to start off with uh, Sam Larson from Water UK, who's going to just talk about the 2030 roadmap. Uh, we've then got four water companies, which I think is 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 great that we've got across across the board. So we've got um, Scottish and Welsh, as well as um, Thames and Anglian, who will be talking about their approaches. We'll then have a bit of a Q&A and a five minute break. Um, we will try and make sure we, we keep that five minute break and keep on time because it is going to have to be quite pacey. Um, and then after the break, we will have uh, two consultancies, Jacobs and Mott McDonald will be uh, giving 10 minutes. Aquir and Waterwise will be sort of also sharing it. And then we'll have a further Q&A session at the end of that. <coughs> Just to let you know, this is all being recorded. Um, it, <coughs> excuse me, it will be available to everybody afterwards. Um, and um, hopefully if people have registered and, and aren't able to attend for whatever region, they'll be able to see this as well. Um, so you don't necessarily have to take lots and lots of notes. Uh, you'll be able to see what comes later. So I think it's just worth having two minutes about the overview of <clears throat> why we're sort of coming about this in terms of net carbon in the water industry. I think it was spring last year, 2019, when the CEOs of the water companies through Water UK got together and they put forward their public interest commitments. Those public interest commitments were, were a nod and an acknowledgement that water companies are as much social enterprises as they are private enterprises. And of course, our Welsh and Scottish colleagues are a different um, uh, structure anyway in that respect. Um, and so there's a whole load of public interests that were, were put forward one of which was to achieve net operational carbon by 2030. Now our Scottish colleagues have gone a step further if you like and said net carbon by 2040 and I'm sure they'll talk a little bit more about that and I think um, the embedded carbon element of it is something that will, will start coming um, but the initial commitment was around operational carbon by 2030. A, a big enough task in its own right um, but a fantastic opportunity to lead the way ahead of um, the government targets of 2050 to make sure that we're really making a difference. And to, just to highlight how important it is, um, I believe the water industry is the second largest user of electricity in the country. We are a major user of power um, and, and therefore getting us to uh, achieve that net zip operational carbon will be a big step forward in where we're going. So um, I want to now introduce uh, Sam, who's going to have 10 minutes on uh, the Water UK and where we've been on the net zero roadmap. Sam is the climate change lead for Water UK. Um, he's a geologist and a project manager by training. He's led numerous projects on the topic, um, including environmental engineering, construction, operations and property issues. Um, he's also a non-executive director of Streetworks UK. And he's going to start talking about um, our, our roadmap as an introduction to today's session. So with that, I'll hand over to Sam. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and thanks also for that uh, safety moment. I found that personally, I found that really helpful. I'm, I'm going to take that on from today forward. So um, thanks for having what UK here to talk about the sector's commitment. I'm going to say a few words about the commitment and the journey we've been on since April 2019 uh, to give a few building blocks to the rest of today's conversation. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as Andy mentioned, in April 2019, the sector came together to make a commitment to reaching net zero operational emissions by 2030. Um, that was recognised at the time as being significantly in advance of the government's 2050 target set in law, uh, was deliberately stretching, um, was an opportunity for the sector to show real climate change leadership, not just in the UK and with regulators, um, but actually internationally. Uh, and since the launch of the commitment, there's been significant interest uh, in the commitment uh, globally. So since making that commitment, the sector has started to create, it's set out its journey uh, to net zero. The, the first part of that and the main part of that was commissioning the consultants, Ricardo and Mark McDonald to draw up a route map uh, to net zero, uh, really building on 10 years worth of operational emissions data that we've been collecting in the sector since uh, a project, a collaborative project with, uh, with Ofwat, the regulator, to come up with a consistent way of measuring and reporting operational emissions from all the water companies. 
So over the last year, uh, Ricardo MacDonald have pulled together all of that 10 years worth of data, uh, analyzed that data uh, and helped the industry set out its path to net zero. So just to, just to give a few building blocks about what that route map tells us, um, the first thing it tells us uh, is that the trajectory in the past since 2011 uh, has been has been downward. Our emissions have fallen by circa 40% since 2011. And that's through the sector's own work on things like renewables, uh, but also a, a significant contribution from grid decarbonisation. Um, and whilst the, the sector's trajectory on emissions is strongly downwards, it won't be enough to reach net zero by 2030 without much faster progress in a number of areas. So, so just from that simple thinking about the trajectory, this really is a significant ambition uh, to, to get to net zero in just a decade and two decades ahead of, of the government's own 2050 target is really stretching. So taking on that stretching ambition, uh, obviously we have to protect customers uh, in that journey and we must find the most efficient path uh, to get to net zero. So I'll say a few things about our current emissions, just, just to, to, to sort of inform thinking about where our emissions currently come from. And in our baseline year, which was 2018-19, the sector's net operational emissions were 2.4 megatons. And the majority of those emissions are associated with that consumption of electricity, with the pumping of water uh, and the treating of waste. And, and as Andy mentioned, that is significant at UK scale and every day we consume roughly 2% of UK's electricity. So a really very significant electricity consumer. Another notable area is that a quarter of our emissions as reported in the carbon accounting workbook uh, are associated with the methane and NOx, which comes from the treatment of sewage and the recycling of wastewater from uh, 28 million homes in the UK. And really those two drive the majority of the sector's story around net zero. So just to say a little about the analysis in the route map itself, um, the route map itself is a, a significant document, a very substantial document, and it's broken into two parts. Uh, on the Water UK webpage for the route map, there are two, two main documents. Uh, the first one is the, is the full route map, the technical route map. It's about 80 pages of technical analysis uh, setting out the, the, the industry's uh, journey to net zero. Uh, and there's also a summary document which sets out the policy, the policy drivers for achieving net zero by 2030. So do, do take the opportunity to have a look at those, but I'll, I'll attempt to summarise the main um, runners and riders in terms of uh, changes in the industry. So with great emphasis on uh, tackling direct reductions and implementing greater renewables first in the route map, uh, we turn to initiatives such as low emissions vehicles. Uh, that's uh, it's a fairly straightforward journey in terms of light uh, passenger vehicles. I think everybody here would recognize the story for, for cars over the next decade. Um, but it's much more challenging when it comes to things like commercial fleet, particularly heavier duty vans and particularly HGVs, where whilst there are some technologies emerging, which help with uh, low emissions vehicles in the heavier classes, they're by no means certain at this stage. So a significant challenge there already. Next, we turn to water and energy saving, uh, leakage uh, reduction, faster leakage reduction, and energy efficiency programs to reduce the intensity of the water that we provide and, and the services that we provide. We also look at the process emissions challenge that I mentioned earlier on, ways of firstly monitoring uh, the process emissions coming from the wastewater treatment process, uh, and then looking to research uh, that can inform innovation and ways of tackling uh, those emissions, uh, and, and finally control measures uh, for various different types of plants in the UK to really start to bring those emissions down within the next 10 years. And finally, we look to renewable power. Uh, and in the route map, we aim to meet as much of our own demand as possible um, through renewable power. Now, those things alone, those direct reductions and those renewables aren't enough 
to get us to net zero on their own in their own right. So we also turn to ways of removing those residual emissions, ways of closing that final gap. So the route map includes um, a greater uptick in things like nature-based solutions, particularly to meet future treatment demands, uh, but also the planting of trees, the restoration of peatland and grassland to, to, to remove some of those residual emissions and get the sector down to net zero. We also acknowledge the need for a UK offsets market. You know, the sector may not be able to do all of this through its own land holdings, and it may need to enter into a UK wide offsets market. And in common with a lot of other uh, companies and entities in the UK, it's quite important that the UK kind of grapples that challenge uh, and establishes a UK offsets market that will help not just this industry, but other industries get to net zero um, by their deadlines. So the full route map gives much more detail on all of those, but just, just to show you one of the pathways that's in the, in the full route map. And on the right hand side is the technology pathway, and that achieves a 96% reduction by 2030 through mainly that first block of measures, um, leaving, as you can see in grey at the bottom, a small gap uh, to make up by some other measures, uh, potentially the UK offsets market. So onto a few conclusions on the last slide. Um, where are we going from here? What will you start to see in 2021? Well, obviously you'll, you'll expect to see the industry meeting the commitments that it's made, particularly um, the development of now more granular plans at individual company level to help find that really efficient transition that protects customers at that, at that more granular scale, at that regional scale. So by July, 2021, each company will be presenting its own its own plan uh, for how it fits into the net zero journey for the sector. We'll also be developing our approaches to things like capital carbon, uh, so that that also supports the government's 2050 target, recognizing that the net zero route map that we've published is focused on those operational emissions as that first steps 2030. And also in July, next year we'll be publishing the sector's first annual emissions report and this really is a report which which sort of lays bare and sets out in a very transparent way uh, what the sector is doing how it's getting on what progress it's making you know what's what's changed in its plans what, what greater information we have about how we propose to get to net zero by 2030. Now there are a number of recommendations for policymakers in that summary uh, document that I mentioned a little while ago, and that's on the Walk UK website. Within that, there is a ten-point plan uh, which sets out uh, all the calls and the actions at policy level across the UK that will really enable this transition to net zero by 2030. But finally, and, and perhaps obviously there will be a requirement for collaboration right across the entire ecosystem in the water industry. Uh, ongoing collaboration with designers and suppliers and constructors to really change the way in which the industry develops assets and manages assets to move to a much lower carbon uh, way of delivering water services to customers over the next 10 years. We're also working with trade associations um, on, on how they can help spread the message and, uh, and help the industry make that transition. But really we're from the central program team at Water UK that's overseeing the sector's commitment to net zero. What we'd really like is contact from, from those with great ideas about what would help uh, get to net zero in 2030. And if anyone feels there's something that will help with a route map or something that's missing from the route map, we'd really welcome contact from yourselves so please don't hesitate to email me at the address at the uh, email address there if you've got some further ideas for us to take into account so thanks uh, thanks for having me here to set that out and uh, Andy I hope that's uh, I hope that's a helpful start for the day that's a, a great start thank you in terms of outlining the road route map and where water UK have come from and giving the time thank you very much um, sun's come out so hence uh, I'm sort of going to one side of my screen to avoid the sun um, can I just remind people for questions through Slido in terms of the Q&A session that will come up in about an, an hour? Um, uh, well, actually, a bit, a bit sooner than that. Um, there's some that have started to come through, but it would be great if others could as well, please. And um, please sort of click your preferred ones in terms of which are the most popular are going to be. 
Uh, I'd like to move on now to Thames Waters experience and in, I'd like to introduce Matt G. Uh, Matt is the Energy and Carbon Strategy and Reporting Manager for Thames Water, mechanical engineer by, by training. He joined as a graduate um, back in the early 2000s. Um, he, he's now sort of responsible for driving the carbon program, including the company-wide um, rolling out of smart meters across two and a half thousand sites. Um, he's led the development of the energy regulation um, and management system, ISO 50001, which is a key element of making sure our new renewable energies are appropriately certified. Um, and he's now developing that carbon plan and has assembled a net zero task force. Um, so he's becoming the subject matter expert across the business. So with that, um, Matt, um, please go ahead. Thank you, Andy. Um, uh, and good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Today, uh, I'm, I'm conscious I'm uh, near the, the front of the agenda, so I thought I'd talk a bit about the size and the shape of the challenge uh, that Net Zero presents. Um, and uh, I'm going to touch upon three questions. Uh, firstly, what is Net Zero Carbon to us at Thames? That is, what are our carbon emissions and what does net zero by 2030 mean? Secondly, how big is that challenge? Uh, we are, where are our main sources of emissions and which are the easiest and indeed hardest areas to address? Third, how are Thames tackling the challenge? So what approach are we taking and will we be able to deliver fast enough to achieve our 2030 goal. But first, as I say, I'm going to talk about uh, what are our carbon emissions. So um, is there a slide that's just skipped over there? Uh, I think the, there's one slide that seems to have been missed in that. Uh, but um, so Sam mentioned that net zero is focused um, on our operational emissions. Uh, the emissions from the water industry are a combination of three areas, as Sam mentioned again, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, and nitrous oxide. Uh, and whilst we report our emissions as carbon, uh, we convert those other two greenhouse gases into a carbon dioxide equivalent uh, using their global warming potential. Um, uh, and methane uh, and nitrous oxide have significantly higher global warming potential than carbon. So if we take, um, if we emit one tonne of methane, it's 25 times more impactful than one tonne of carbon. Uh, and nitrous oxide is nearly 300 times more impactful than one tonne of carbon. So those two other emission sources have a massive impact on, uh, on the industry's carbon footprint. Uh, and you can see that um, in, in the graph there. Um, it's also worth highlighting that um, the emissions of any of our outsourced partners are also captured by our target. So we have to work uh, closely with them. Uh, so what does this look like in practice for Thames? Well, as I say, on the left there, we've got uh, a waterfall chart showing that despite achieving a huge reduction against our 1990 baseline, our carbon dioxide equivalent emissions in Thames were 258,000 tonnes uh, in 1920. Um, over the last two decades, our strategy has focused on energy efficiency. Uh, so our process uses only the energy we really need it to. Um, we've renewably focused on renewable generation, including maximising biogas production and optimising the sludge logistics so that we don't have more transport than we need. Um, uh, and we also get the sludge in the places where it gives us best value. Uh, and we also have looked at our electricity purchase and looked at renewable electricity purchase, both from the grid, but also via private wire supplies, including one uh, which supplies the largest uh, sewage treatment works in the UK, Beckton. Um, so we've taken a lot of the biggest uh, and quickest wins already, uh, but we're still left with this 258,000 ton uh, challenge remaining. Uh, and we recognise in that uh, that 
some of the areas are going to be harder to address than others. Methane reduces, uh, yeah, methane uh, releases from sewage sludge um, and nitrous oxide from sewage treatment uh, are neither easy to measure nor easy to address. Um, uh, and with those high global warming potential that they each have, you can see the significant impact on that as a proportion of our overall uh, remaining challenge. So this is why it's so important to consider the challenge as net zero, um, with gains in one area making up for potential shortfalls um, by 2030 in another. Uh, and you'll note that aside from the process emissions, we also have significant work to move away from fossil fuels, uh, and so do our outsourced partners, both in terms of transport but also uh, in our static plant. So what is our approach to tackling the challenge? Uh, in TEMS, we have set out a strategy which uh, tackles the challenge in four ways. Uh, firstly, uh, reducing. Now, this must come first. Uh, and one of the drivers of the fantastic new sludge advanced anaerobic digestion plant shown here on the right uh, at Basingstoke was to reduce the volumes of sludge being produced um, out of the end of that process, um, which obviously saves um, on HGV vehicle movements, moving that sludge cake away from the site once it's been processed and taken away to fields, as well as obviously cutting down on traffic and things like that. Um, but making those reductions in, in fossil fuel use uh, is obviously a, a, a really important thing. Um, Secondly, switching, um, where we can move from one source of energy to another, something I'll explore more about in a moment. Thirdly, uh, netting off, if we can produce more renewable energy than we need ourselves, then this helps to address the emissions we can eliminate, can't eliminate so easily. Fourth, and finally, uh, offsetting. This must be a last resort. Um, and it will as it will cost us money, uh, uh, which could be better spent on investing uh, in our assets. So I'd like to look a little bit closer now at the area of switching. Um, and that is the change from one energy source to another. Um, at Thames, we produce over 135 million cubic meters each year uh, of biogas. Uh, and as part of our net zero, we have been considering how we best put it to use. Uh, as the chart shows, using a renewable energy source such as biogas instead of heavy fossil fuels has big benefits. Um, if you contrast that with electricity generation, which uh, 10 years ago was quite similar and had an equivalent carbon impact uh, to, to, to grid electricity, um, but has been rapidly decarbonizing and is, is due to continue to decarbonize significantly over the next 10 years. Um, uh, yeah, you, you'll see that um, the value of our biogas used to displace petrol, diesel, and fossil fuels um, is far greater. So at Thames, we're looking at maximizing our use of biogas in boilers, uh, especially gas oil boilers. Um, we're looking at converting our biogas to biomethane. Uh, we're also looking at whether we can use it in our HGV fleets um, to see if we can run them on biogas. Um, now, the pace of rollout is dependent partly on how government policy and uh, involves in, the, in HGVs and biomethane and technology and things like that. But the carbon and energy efficiency argument is clear. It's better to use biogas in boilers, which are 90% efficient, than in a 40 to 60% efficient CHP engine. So uh, in conclusion, uh, net zero, zero uh, is about more than electric vehicles. Uh, and it's it, the electric vehicle is kind of the poster boy of the, of, of the kind of the decarbonization movement in many ways. Um, and yes, they're part of the solution, but for the wastewater industry, um, the wastewater and sludge processes are the biggest source of emissions. And so the area we need to um, really focus on, but they also represent a really big source of opportunity with that biogas. Um, 
our partners and suppliers are going to have to be part of this too, both in terms of reducing their own footprint, but also providing some of the solutions. Um, uh, achieving net zero will require a change of approach. It will require changes to the ways of working um, uh, in the business. Uh, this is not going to be a bolt on the side of uh, the business. We're going to have to look at how we use that biogas, use it differently, how we drive different vehicles and optimize the logistics. So it's going to really touch the core of how we operate the business on a day to day basis. Um, uh, and we don't have all the answers today. Um, we will need to continue to uh, innovate, collaborate, um, uh, work with others uh, to, to find new solutions. Um, and we will need to continue to evolve our approach uh, as both technology, um, be it heat pumps, hydrogen, uh, and, uh, uh, and other technologies come along. We'll need to, to consider those as our, in our plans uh, over the next 10 years. Um, so will we reach uh, net zero by 2030? Only time will tell, but um, I'm, I, I firmly believe that in terms we're asking each other the right questions, uh, we're challenging the norm, um, this will give us a fighting chance of reaching our goal. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Um, so we'd also ask Matt some questions during the Q&A. Uh, now I'd like to move on to Anglian Water's experience with Richard Buckingham. Um, Richard is the climate uh, change and carbon manager at Anglian Water. He has the responsibility for the, the zero carbon roadmap um, and the integration of the climate change mitigation and adaption of Anglian Water's business, which I think is, is critical to the overall delivery of this. It has to be integrated. He recently joined Anglian and spent the last five years developing small holding and experimenting with efforts to reduce carbon footprint with himself and his family, which I think is a we can all do little things differently, but maybe that's a, a bit more sort of putting it into practice. Um, he, prior to that, he was a construction um, director at the Waste and Re Resources Action Programme um, and was looking at the circular economy and how carbon can be reduced in that respect. Um, and has undertaken similar roles with our and the building design partnership previously. So with that, Richard. Uh, right, thanks Andy. Hello everybody. Um, I'll just try and move this forward. Okay, here we go. Right, apologies for the delay. Okay, so just wanted to start with a little bit about the Anglian Water perspective really, uh, and linking both the Zero Carbon Agenda and the Climate Change Agenda. As Andy just said, these two things um, have to be addressed in parallel. So our purpose is to bring environmental and social prosperity to the region we serve through our commitment to love every drop and love every drop is our kind of strap line really. Um, so we have some particular issues to face in the southeast of England and I'll come on to those in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, but our long term ambitions are to make the east of England resilient to the risks of drought and flooding, enable sustainable economic and housing growth, work with others to achieve significant improvements in ecological quality across our catchments. And then the final one, which is the topic of the day, uh, to be a net zero business by 2030. Okay, so just the specifics really of uh, the Anglian region, um, just over a quarter of our region uh, is below sea level. We're a particularly flat and low lying region, which means um, we have to expend a lot of energy in pumping water and wastewater around. Um, we haven't got the luxury of uh, gravity fed systems in many cases. We're also the driest region in the UK. Uh, our population is expected to arise. Um, so there's a likely increase of about a million homes over the next 25 years in our region. Uh, and that of course means the demand for water will increase, uh, but the uh, supply of water uh, won't. Uh, so I think there's a particular thing here with regard to climate change adaptation and understanding the risks. So we've done lots of work around drought and flooding uh, and the adaptation approaches that we need to undertake in order to um, minimise and mitigate against those threats going forward. Uh, and as part of that, we put together the Anglian Water Climate Change Adaptation Report, which is uh, part of the third round of the um, CCA reporting, which we are just about to submit. Um, 
we've also thought about uh, how we improve the resilience of our assets. So all of our major uh, investments go through a, a kind of climate change resilience assessment. Um, we've also been thinking about uh, climate change temperature rises. I think, <clears throat> as we all know, the Paris Agreement is to limit temperature rises to one and a half degrees. Um, uh, I think we, it's becoming increasingly clear that that's an unlikely target. So we are starting to plan for higher temperature increases. And we've introduced this strap line fit for four. Are our investments resilient to a four degree uh, rise as we move towards the end of the century? So in light of that, uh, here's just a little schematic of how our kind of climate change adaptation reporting uh, has evolved over time so starting in 2010. Uh, so for the last two years we've submitted a climate related financial disclosure and also a carbon disclosure project submission. Uh, you may have seen uh, just a few weeks ago the Chancellor announced that um, all large businesses, rather vague but nonetheless, uh, will be from 2025 required to uh, submit a uh, task force for climate related financial disclosures uh, um, uh, submission. Uh, we do a CDP one, which it will be in line with the two things. So hopefully in future, we'll only have to do a single submission. And um, we've just got our score back from CDP and we got an A. Uh, and we're very proud of that. And not many companies have got an A. So we're, we're thinking about climate change adaptation in the right way. And this also feeds into financing. So we have actually been out to the markets and secured some green bonds. And that's based upon in no small part how we're addressing uh, adaptation and mitigation going forward. So there is a piece here about how we're addressing climate change, which feeds into how we fund our businesses going forward. Now, um, Sam mentioned this, uh, and it was also mentioned by Andy around uh, capital carbon, which are effectively scope three, <clears throat> excuse me, scope three emissions. Some of you may know capital carbon as embodied carbon or embedded carbon, but this is essentially the carbon associated with the materials that we use to construct assets uh, and the construction processes that we employ. And we've been addressing this issue for some while, and you can see on the sch schematic on the right hand side that the majority of our projects uh, have come into the low carbon and low cost category. You can see there's a very, very strong correlation there between uh, carbon reductions and cost reductions. And this has been achieved through addressing carbon first, and then it turns out that cost follows. So rather than the historic view that building low carbon assets was uh, a, a more expensive process, it's actually not the case based upon the evidence that we have. Um, so our capital carbon reductions, uh, we've achieved a 61% reduction between 2015 and 20 over our 2010 baseline. And then we have a further target of, of achieving a 65% reduction during this AMP. Now, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, uh, in a different context, lots of the low hanging fruit, if you like, have already been taken <clears throat> from this agenda. But we're still hoping to kind of move forward and continue to reduce. And although this isn't part of the zero carbon route map, um, uh, as Sam alluded to earlier, I think it's very likely that it will be uh, in due course or it will be part of kind of uh, uh, not necessarily the route map, but a reduction. Now, in terms of renewables, uh, we've received our uh, highest ever generation uh, last year, up 8% from the previous year. We've now got a, a partner um, to deliver much of our renewable energy. We've just finished our largest array at Grafham uh, Reservoir, 11.6 uh, megawatts. Uh, and we've started uh, trialing and investing in battery storage, energy storage devices. So on the bottom right there, that uh, uh, shipping container is actually a rather large battery so that we can maximize the output of our uh, PV arrays and, and use that energy uh, when the sun isn't shining. So we have a target of 44% of our energy for renewables by 2025. Uh, the next phase of our solar and storage installations are rolled out across the region uh, by uh, early 20, 90, uh, 2022, we'll have about 100 solar sites. And the next phase, uh, it moves on to think about onshore wind opportunities and the, uh, uh, the difficulties around planning, I think, will, will, will come up here. And I think there's an interesting relationship between the declaration of a climate emergency by 
local planning authorities and by the government and stringent targets how that plays out in terms of planning permissions will be an interesting thing and we'll, we'll have to wait and see i think so just a little example of, of how we're thinking about uh uh, moving forward in terms of treatment. So this is a, a natural wetland uh, wastewater treatment uh, scheme uh, in Ingoldsthorpe in Norfolk. Um, so uh, there's a clear reduction in capital carbon because of the way that the, the, the uh, treatment works um, has been constructed. Um, there's obvious biodiversity and natural capital and social immunity gains from such an approach. I think you know, most people would agree that that uh, image is far more attractive than what you might consider a traditional uh, water treatment works. Uh, and there's obvious carbon sequestration opportunities with this, not large, but I think as we've seen the difficulties of the journey, um, we're going to have to capture all of those opportunities. And here's an example of a, a collaboration project that we've entered into. So on the left hand side, you can see not, not yet constructed uh, 13 hectares of greenhouses. Now they're heated from the uh, warm water outflow from a local water treatment facility. Um, uh, and it then means that the water coming back from the greenhouse is cooler and it's returned to the river at a lower temperature. So we benefit. Um, so this is 13 hectares of greenhouses, about, it'll produce about 20 tonnes of tomato a day, uh, it uses 75% less carbon than a similar scheme, much less water, far more productive. But there's an issue here around who saves the carbon. So clearly the operators of the greenhouses do, but we have contributed to that carbon reduction. So I think there's a, there's a dynamic here about how you account for carbon savings associated with partnership projects. Similarly, we're doing another project where uh, a telecoms company is using our mains to run lots of their cables, which means they are not then digging trenches and, and laying pipes. So they're saving carbon. So there's a, there's a dynamic here about how we how we partner with uh, other uh, schemes and organizations uh, and work out how we account for and uh, attribute the carbon savings. And I think just the final thing, and many of these things have been mentioned before, uh, the, the big issues, HGV decarbonization is a problem. It's, it's not yet with us. Hydrogen may uh, provide the solution, but that's certainly uh, uh, not on the immediate horizon. It's also been mentioned that the nitrous oxide and the methane emissions associated with uh, uh, water treatment processes, uh, the reductions in those is going to be a challenge. Um, we're going to have to start collaborating with a range of stakeholders. I've mentioned two there. Uh, I've heard of other collaborations where um, uh, non-domestic buildings are being heated by wastewater treatment. Those, those kind of things I think we need to kind of embrace um we're going to require focus and there's going to require some innovation to do this because it's difficult um we need to think about sequestration uh, options now if we start planting trees they don't really sequester carbon for a couple of decades really so there's a, there's a bit of a lag and then i think just getting back to the to our approach with regard to capital carbon um, we very much viewed that through the carbon lens so viewing these things from a carbon perspective, certainly from, from our experience has led to the largest carbon reductions. So as we move forward on the net zero carbon journey, uh, viewing all issues through a carbon lens, in my view, affords us the, the, the greatest opportunity for carbon reductions. And I think we're just about on time, so I'm gonna leave it there and I look forward to some questions later, later on. Thank you, Richard. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to the Scottish water experience. So uh, Miranda Jux Turner is going to uh, introduce that. Um, she's currently the technical lead for sustainability and climate change in Scottish Water Zero Emission Team. Um, she's been with the, the water industry for some time and started her career undertaking flow and load surveys in sewers in Wales. I, I also did some of that stuff, which I remember it well. Um, she's been involved in a whole load of things to do with water efficiency, biodiversity, implementing the Water Framework Director, and has taken secondments into the Scottish executive, which I actually think is, is very interesting in terms of the regulatory bit. I saw one of the questions around that. She's now been working on um, climate change for over a decade and retains an interest in all things sustainable. So with that, uh, Miranda, welcome. Thank you, Andy. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, 
Okay, so Scotland um, has a different net zero route map to the English companies. So I'm going to um, just give you an overview of that, highlight some of the differences between Scotland and um, the English route map. Um, our route map is to go beyond net zero by 2040. I am looking for the little arrows because the click's not working, there we go. Um, to go beyond net zero by 2040 for both operational and capital emissions, or as we call them, investment um, emissions. Our net zero emissions route map ties in with um, the water sector vision for Scotland. This is not Scottish Water's vision, but a vision that was worked up with our regulators and stakeholders right through the water sector in Scotland. Um, and uh, from that, um, Scottish Water has its, its own vision as well. The net zero emissions, um, be achieving beyond net zero emissions is one of our three strategic ambitions um, and arguably the, the boldest ambition um, alongside service excellence and great value and financial su sustainability. This is our net zero emissions route map website. Um, you'll see that uh, that Purple box covers transformation, um, basically how Scottish Water is going to get from here to there. And it consists not on this website, but our transformation program consists of several route maps. The net zero emissions route map was the first to be published, but there will be a number of route maps helping us to transform our business in order to deliver our strategic um, plan and our, our strategic objectives. And you'll also notice this pale blue box is supporting a flourishing Scotland. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So a quick look at the milestones within our route map. Uh, operationally, we are aiming for a 60% reduction by 2025, which is 15% lower than we are now and a further 15% reduction by 2030, which will take us to 75%. We haven't currently set an interim goal for our capital carbon, but we will set that. Um, we will set a 2030 goal for our investment carbon. Um, and of course, net zero emissions for everything by 2040. So looking at a little more of the detail, um, currently, our um, operational carbon footprint has reduced by 45% on a 2006-07 baseline. That does not include green tariff electricity. We don't discount green tariff because we use the mandatory location-based reporting, not the optional additional um, market-based reporting. We currently um, use around 700, uh, sorry, 575 gigawatt hours a year of um, electricity, um, grid electricity, which equates to uh, around 160,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide. Um, so this is around two thirds of our operational carbon footprint at the moment, um, although obviously that decreases each year with the decarbonisation of the grid. Um, so it's uh, it's a a big um, area for us to reduce. Um, but it also gives us um, a lot of potential in terms of um, uh, renewables, which I'll come on to in a, in a moment. Um, we've been working up MAC curves and uh, what clearly comes out ahead is the boring but cheap energy efficiency. Um, we find that often pays back very, very quickly um, in a matter of months. Um, and then the more um, sexier but uh, more expensive way of delivering um, carbon savings, such as artificial intelligence, virtual treatment works, that kind of, of thing, um, come further along the, the curve. And people get very excited about those, um, those sexy things, but um, it's the boring stuff 
that is uh, cheap and easy um, ways of reducing operational carbon. Uh, a big opportunity is for Scotland to um, catch up with uh, England and Wales in terms of um, bio resource and sludge biogas. Um, we have not developed this as much as the companies down south and we see approximately 90 gigawatt hours of opportunity over the next 10 years in bio resource. For renewables, we currently generate and consume um, around 60 gigawatt hours of renewables. Um, and we host 830 gigawatt hours, roughly, of, of renewable generation. Um, that's third party generation that we host on our land. Um, building off what we've been doing over the last few years, we have set ourselves a big goal to um, self-generate or host 1300 gigawatt hours of renewable generation. And we are aiming for self-sufficiency in electricity. Uh, and we're currently assessing the potential at 500 sites. In terms of investment emissions, uh, the greatest potential, as I'm sure many of you will know, is at the front end of the, of the capital process. So um, we are blessed, <laughs> un, unlike Anglian, um, we are blessed with mountains. And so we have uh, more opportunity to use gravity. Um, but also as, uh, as Sam mentioned, um, nature-based solutions um, will, will help us reduce our, our embodied emissions. Um, and then we go through design, materials, construction uh, with diminishing opportunities for reducing carbon. Um, I don't have time to go into the details, um, but we're looking at things like uh, reducing the materials um, used in, in tank construction and also um, off-site fabrication and, uh, and actually, um, particularly on the islands, we, we've uh, recently installed a, a new water treatment works on one of the islands which was delivered whole by ferry. Um, moving on to sequestration, um, I'm speeding up Andy. Um, so we're looking at quantifying the carbon that's currently sequestered within our land holdings and we're working with the James Hutton Institute to do that. Uh, we're working across the Scottish public sector on um, principles for an accredited sequestration scheme which will be uh, simpler than the Woodland Carbon Code which is aimed at um, creating carbon credits for selling which we won't be doing. Um, we just need to be able to, to get a a, a good um, auditable way of sequestering carbon on our own land. And our sequestration program includes 400 hectares of peatland restoration that's currently underway with a potential further 1200 hectares um, for opportunity there. 100 hectares of tenant farm conversion to woodland is now in planning too. And I did mention at the beginning that um, we go beyond net zero emissions so uh, this also includes uh, not only being sort of net uh, of carbon negative, but also increasing the biodiversity on the land we own, um, supporting a flourishing Scotland, which includes growing Scotland's natural capital and helping Scotland um, as a whole reach net zero emissions. And Richard mentioned um, the, the need to think about how we account for reductions that we facilitate um, for other people and um, the heat from waste water project that, that Scottish Water is, has been pioneering is a good example of that. Um, transformation demands innovation and there are a number of innovation challenges highlighted on our route map. Um, the description of the webinar includes looking at challenges and opportunities and I strongly believe that overcoming challenges gives us the opportunities. So innovation is a, is a really key part of how we move to net zero emissions. Um, I won't have time to go into the 
monitoring and reviewing progress, but rest assured we will be monitoring and reviewing our progress. Um, and those are a couple of, uh, of key um, web addresses should you want to find out more information about Scottish Waters Net Zero Emissions Route Map. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. I'm sure there'll be some plenty of questions coming um, in the next section after the Vivian. Um, so we now want to sort of look at uh, Welsh Waters experience. Uh, Vivian Evans is going to be introducing us to this. Um, she is uh, the Environment Permit Specialist uh, and currently working on a range of projects around uh, nature-based solutions and low carbon solutions. I'm delighted to say that she's a previous uh, winner of the Young Environmentalist of the Year Award through SciWEM, which I think is brilliant. Um, and that was all around alternative protein supplies in the circular economy. So with that, Vivian. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, yeah, morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation so far. Uh, really great to see what other companies are uh, doing and some of the case studies that, that you've gone through. Um, oop, are we clicking through? There we go. Um, right. Um, so my opening gambit for this presentation that I'll come back to throughout is that carbon has traditionally been related to energy. And at Welsh Water, we aim to align ourselves with Scottish Water's models. Um, thanks very much for that presentation a moment ago. Um, and make a we aim to make better whole life carbon decisions. So we're going to take you on a little um, journey through Dil Cymru's path to net zero or carbon ISIL if there's any Welsh colleagues tuned in. Um, right, and so a bit of a delay here, I think. Okay, um, so first first um, stop on our journey will be a bit of context around the frameworks and drivers that shape our work. We'll then look at our current achievements and our, move on to our AMP7 improvement plans, and then take a slightly longer horizons and look at our 2050 vision. So um, just to um, set the scene a little bit, I'm not sure who we've got on, on the call today, but um, we're a, a water and wastewater service provider and we supply uh, 3 million customers, which creates to about uh, 1 million households. Um, we're a not-for-profit water company. We don't have shareholders, uh, which means all of our uh, gains can go back in for the advancement of the environment and for the benefit of customers. So our value statement is to earn the customers uh, earn the trust of customers every day. And our customers are, of course, expecting more of us um, when it comes to uh, environmental and ethical outcomes. So um, this value statement is becoming um, ever more pertinent uh, when relating to carbon. OK, so uh, I've got a few. Um, oh, is it catching up? Yes, a few uh, frameworks here. Just to help understand the context a little more. So our 2050 vision launched in March 2018 and it sets out our, our long-term goals. Uh, the document details 18 strategic responses um, in answer to the many challenges that lie ahead. And one of these responses um, states, we aim to become energy neutral, uh, an energy neutral business contributing to the circular economy in our local region by 2050. And it, it is this um, and other strategic responses that will entail, hopefully allow us to become a really truly world-class and resilient, sustainable um, water service. Um, so in, in addition to that strategic document, um, Wales, oop, yep, um, an additional document that frames our, our approach is Welsh Government's low carbon strategy. So this targets a 95% reduction by 2050 against a uh, 1990 baseline. Um, and in the low carbon Wales approach, Welsh Water, um, well, Welsh Water contributes to 0.2% um, of Wales's total carbon footprint, which might not sound huge, uh, but we are of course, a very influential and uh, prominent stakeholder to really uh, be an enabler for um, further reduction. So in addition to that um, framework that guides us, um, uh, a very specific one that is ever more present in our work is uh, the Future Generations Act, which requires bodies in Wales to think about the long term impact of their decisions and to work better with um, people, communities, communities and with other organisations uh, with the aim of uh, preventing persistent problems such as poverty, health inequality and of course climate change. And this act is unique to Wales and it really offers a, a huge opportunity to make really long, long lasting positive change to the current and future generations. So just a few uh, sort of background points that uh, will help frame our work. OK, so moving on to our second stop on our, on our roadmap journey, which is our progress to date. 
So just a, just a few numbers here to, to go through. Um, our net carbon emissions for the period of 2018-2019, we've delivered a 79% tonne uh, CO2 equivalent reduction compared to our 2010 and 2011 baseline. So over a sort of seven, eight year period. Um, and the green tile shows our increase on on-site generation. So currently we power roughly 25% of our energy needs. Um, and uh, some of the key enablers uh, for this reduction have been the significant investment of our uh, on-site renewable energy programme and also our innovative supply contract that we've got. So all of our uh, electricity comes from a, a Danish company called Orsted, which provides us with 100% renewable energy, which is um, we go backed. OK. So moving on to um, oop, uh, a second graph. So this is just a diagrammatic, if they all come up, uh, this is just a diagrammatic version of the numbers that I just mentioned, but broken down a little bit more specifically. So um, there's actually a, a, a number per drive that we can see. Um, and this is this granular detail is what I'm going to come in on to just now. So, um, oop, playing catch up. OK, so we're now looking specifically at a year by year um, and area by area. So as you can see, um, and as I stated at the start of the process, it's our uh, process and transport um, emissions, which are were historically not uh, or not routinely included in carbon calculations, but is really now where we need to prioritise going forward with the aim of taking that wider perspective um, that I've spoken about and uh, all the other companies have also touched on, um, specifically uh, Scotland, um, with your more inclusive picture that you, you spoke about earlier. OK, so another graph here. Sorry if it's like death by colourful graphs um, this morning, but um, this the, all of these graphs have been taken from our slide packs that we have been rolling out um, in energy workshops with all of our operational and capital staff, which is why we've got quite so many, quite uh, a different range of graphs. And But all of that is part of our um, strategy to help sort of demystify carbon and advance our carbon literacy across the company. So in this graph, um, um, thank you, Andy. Um, so in this graph, it just shows the reduction over the next 10 years we're striving for. Again, a reminder that it's transport and process we specifically aim to um, reduce. Um, so I think probably most companies will have agreed the current working from home situation has probably addressed um, some of the huge targets we all had around uh, reducing travel miles um, for staff. Um, and in addition to the hydrogen uh, and electric fleet uh, conversion that many uh, other companies have spoken about. Um, and when it comes to process, we're working towards a 50% uh, reduction compared to our baseline for carbon process um, associated with wastewater um, treatment. So I'm just going to quickly um, jot on to the uh, final couple of slides. Um, so reduction and generation. This is now looking at our 2050 vision. Uh, so that longer term horizon that I was speaking about at the start. Um, um, and our targets for these will be published in 2021 to support this. But here were just some snippets here. So we aim to generate enough energy to match our consumption and for our assets to be centrally controlled and uh, designed to minimise energy use. Uh, we aim to produce renewable fuels and uh, increase other added value um, projects. And um, just touching on two uh, case studies very quickly, just on my final slide, if I'm moving on, hopefully. Ah, a bit of a lag. Um, there we go. So um, on top of the reduction and generation, these are two really proactive projects that we've been working on uh, that I'm really looking forward to, to sharing with you um, very quickly. One is the um, modelling or, or the car climate balance of uh, Welsh Waters land holdings, uh, which has been led by my colleague, uh, colleague Alex Herridge, which is um, Welsh Water owns about 37,000 um, hectares of land across um, Wales, so it's really important we understand how these different uh, land types um, absorb and emit carbon. And then moving on to the uh, one of the final projects that many of the other companies have spoken about is um, understanding how nature-based solutions uh, like wetlands, uh, learning from our Anglian Water colleagues there, uh, can really help reduce our OPEX carbon. And uh, these two projects, along with 
with some of our ongoing work uh, linked to campaigns to reduce customer use of water, um, uh, to reduce customer use of water and additional staff and, and customer facing circular economy approach and returning to a central point that Richard and Anglian uh, made in, in the presentation, that, that it's that partnership collaboration um, that will also be critical in driving changes in our 2050 vision. So yeah, thanks very much. Whistle stop till there. <laughs> Thank you, Vivian. Um, so we've got 10 minutes for questions before we have a, have a quick break um, and I'm going to use Slido for this. So um, please do put your questions on Slido. I know some have come up through the chat break uh, chat um, on Zoom, um, but actually we're just going to be using Slido on this because it allows people to vote for the most popular. There's been a number of questions which have been directed to the, the speakers already, so could I ask that the speakers just reply to those individually and everybody will be able to see the Q&A at the end of this when, when the notes come out, but it just allows us to get through uh, more questions through that way. Um, the first question or two questions that I'm going to combine, which are up there in terms of the most popular, is around um, how we're measuring things. Are we measuring everything? Are we confident about that? Um, and particularly, are we dealing with scope three emissions? And I, I just thought with the roadmap conversation that we started with with Sam, that maybe Sam could just give his views on, on that particular question. Yeah, sure. So um, there's probably a few things to set up. I think first one, really, the root map is a is a data user, and it draws uh, it draws its data set from the carbon accounting workbook um, developed in conjunction with uh, Uqwear and Offwat and all the water companies about uh, ten years ago. Um, and that workbook, well, Sport UK, it's not a Sport UK product, it's actually an Uqwear Uqwear project. It's updated every year. Um, to sort of adapt to the latest thinking on uh, on carbon accounting and, and carbon reporting, you know, drawing in more areas of scope each year and, and picking up, uh, you know, changes in best practice in reporting. Um, and one of the observations actually that came straight away from the production of the route map based on all that information was that the carbon accounting workbook in itself is, is sector leading. Uh, we haven't actually found another example in the UK of a sector having something like that, that that sort of brings together consistently all of the emissions from an entire sector in the UK or or at this stage, you haven't found anyone anywhere else in the world that does it either. So um, it's a pretty good system. Of course, it will need to continue to evolve. And I know our career has got future work on that. Great. Thank you. Um, Another popular question, some, some of the questions that are coming up we'll answer in the second set of Q&As after the second set of um, speakers. Um, but another question has come up, we're talking a lot about in-house power production. Uh, production to levels required for the water industry essentially takes us into the realms of power generators and away from the core business. Um, do we have the people to power for this? And, and I think that's a good question for Matt, um, if Matt could come in and give his response about water companies becoming uh, power generators. Um, thanks, Andy. Uh, whilst obviously we do need to look at the challenge of um, generating energy because we are producing it, whether we like it or not, we're producing biogas. We've got to do something with it. Um, and we've been, uh, in terms, we've been generating electricity with it for many years. We've got expertise in that space. Um, we need, do need to recognise that the core business uh, is very much around treating sewage um, treating water, um, providing those services to our customers. Um, and so we need to find a balance, I suppose is what I'm saying, between um, addressing those core needs uh, and then looking at um, if we can maximise the value of that biogas, either by continuing to generate electricity or using it in other ways in our vehicles, uh, putting it gas to grid. Um, they're all things that the industry is um, looking at and, and starting to do, uh, but we need to make sure we keep our eyes firmly on the core business first and foremost. Um, would be my would be my response. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is is probably not one of the most popular, but I'm taking chair prerogative on this one, and it's about our our regulators and are our regulators ready. Now, I know in Scotland, um, the regulator has actually done quite an enlightened response recently to, to some of the price review there. So I wonder if that's something that Miranda could just sort of comment on in terms of are the regulators ready for this? 
Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, the, the, what often gets forget, forgotten is that we have a different set of regulators in Scotland. Um, so our, we don't under off what we come under um, the Water Industry Commission for Scotland. Um, and our price review um, or strategic review, as it's called up here, um, was quite different this time around for SR21. Uh, we're on a six year programme, uh, so from 21 to 27. And this time, rather than have specific objectives set and a, a set amount of money in order to deliver them, um, we've basically been given uh, a pot of money and, um, and we're discussing with um, all our stakeholders. We've, had, we've got an ongoing um, engagement process um, to identify where things um, need to be prioritised. Um, and it's a, it's a rolling it's a rolling program. Um, so we don't know yet what we're going to be investing in in three years time because we're, we're doing it in, in smaller parts. Um, and yes, the, the WIX, uh, as the abbreviation is, um, is, is very supportive of the low carbon um, agenda and, and has said that we need to deliver um, low carbon solutions um, at, a, at the lowest cost. Um, so it's uh, it's a it's great to have that support from uh, from one of our um, most important regulators, um, and uh, and there is actually a, a an amount of money set aside um, to help fund those projects that would be much lower carbon, but we wouldn't ordinarily um, invest in them because they are a much higher cost. So where where that balance. Um, you saw on, on Anglian's um, uh, presentation the, the graph with the four quadrants and, and most of the, uh, the, the low carbon, low cost projects, but there were some projects that are low carbon and higher cost. And um, in order to help us hit net zero, there will be additional funding available to, to help facilitate those projects where appropriate. Yeah, so I, I think that's, it's been a good approach there. And I'm sort of hoping that Offwatt will take some lessons learned from the WIG um, when it comes to the next price review down, down south. Um, next question, question I'd, uh, is really directed towards Richard, um, I think. It's how are you accounting for embedded carbon um, and the emitted, the emitted by infrastructure upgrades um, and, and the, the business as usual curve? I think that's because Anglian have been doing this for some time. I think it'd be great to learn from your experience on that. Well, in terms of in terms of um, kind of embedded carbon, we call it capital carbon. Let's just clarify: capital carbon is the same as embodied or embedded. However, you want to say it. So this is the carbon associated with uh, the kind of construction materials that we that we use and the construction processes that we employ. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the the carbon implications of the construction processes. Shouldn't be ignored because they can be quite considerable. And when you think about design, the more uh, uh, infrastructure you can put above ground generally the lower the carbon because you're not you're not digging and hauling off site we've already talked about hgvs and so on so uh, in terms of our construction projects our infrastructure projects we we measure the amount of capital carbon associated with all of the um materials we use we've got a very sophisticated um kind of set of carbon models uh, based upon all the um the materials we use it uses the ICE, the University of Bath ICE database of embodied carbon as its basis, and then information supplied by suppliers. Um, uh, and then we understand, you know, that the carbon associated with the construction with the construction processes that we use, and we calculate all that, and we we come up with a number. And as as we've said, the generally, uh, and, and Miranda was quite right that there are some that sit outside this, but generally, um, lower carbon equals lower cost, not universally so. Um, so that's how we do it for our, our scope three with regard to our kind of construction uh, projects. And I, I think we're a little bit ahead of the curve in that. I don't think that's that's universally adopted quite yet. But I think as Sam mentioned uh, right at the beginning, uh, it's likely, I think, that these kind of scope three emissions will be included within zero carbon targets in due course. Great. Thank you. I think we've got time for, for one more. So um, Vivian, I think this probably is something in terms of the nature-based solutions and wetlands that uh, we've been talking about and you mentioned your huge area of uh, resource in Wales. Um, 
do wetlands also require high fencing to keep the public, in particular children, away on public health grounds, um, you know, i.e. keeping them away from potentially harmful pathogens if we're starting to use wetlands for uh, wastewater treatment? Just wondered if you'd like to have a, I don't know that's going to be relevant to your permitting role as well, I just wondered if you wanted to have a comment on that. Is, uh, is Vivian there? I'm afraid Vivian's having some problems, but maybe Tony can uh, can help with this. Okay. Um, so I don't know, um, Richard, that was actually directed to you at Anglian, <laughs> but I thought it would be worth for Viv uh, Vivian to answer. I don't know if you want to answer that question as well in terms of the permitting around wetlands. What's for sewage uh, well, I can answer the question in the sense that I, I don't have an answer, I'm afraid. Uh, I can take that away <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and find out the specifics. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I can't answer that right now. So it's a good, good question when that comes up. So thank you for your questions on, on Slido. Um, we're just going to take a, a five minute break now. Um, I'd like to thank all the panellists for the, their contributions in, in the first half of this um, and look forward to the second half. So um, I'd like to introduce Ariana Brottle from Jacobs. Um, she is the, part of the Global Water Sector Carbon Specialist over 10 years experience of working with academic government, governmental and consulting organisations across the board, been involved in the emission factor database for the 2019 IPCC uh, refinement of that and importantly been involved in the work that Jacobs, have, oh I've got the, uh, this is the wrong way round. <laughs> I see that we're, um, yeah sorry it is, I, I, it, it is Ariana next. Um, She's also been involved in that the Jacobs project in terms of emissions and the water industry research project to look at the carbon accounting workbook of where the emissions are coming from, which was a very interesting document we commented quite a lot on. Um, previously, she'd been working in various carbon reduction projects in New York City. Um, so with that, Ariana, um, welcome and look forward to your contribution. Thank you, Andy. I'm great, very grateful for the opportunity to talk today about something that is my passion. And I've been studying and working for a couple of years. And especially after hearing so many great examples from water companies and what we are doing to be part of the solution to address climate change. So my brief talk today, I'll be covering um, the unique challenges and opportunities associated with the elephant in the room. So process emissions um, of greenhouse gas from wastewater treatment works. So first we know as highlighted in the previous talks and in the roadmap and the Committee of Climate Change Six budget report that was released last week, the process emissions reduction is a hot spot for the water industry and is likely to prove to be one of the toughest challenges we will face. And I will talk a little bit more about why that's the case. But first, what are process emissions, right? And some of the presentations before me have already touched on that. So nitrous oxide, which is the focus of my talk, is produced during nitrification and denitrification processes to remove carbon and nutrients from our wastewater streams. And methane is produced through anaerobic processes for sludge treatment and it's released from unintentional leakages. Both are very site specific and process specific. And as Matt already mentioned, it's important to keep in mind that these two gases, methane and nitrous oxide, are also very potent greenhouse gas. Um, and any form of carbon sequestration or offsetting is only removing carbon dioxide, not methane or nitrous oxide. So these need to be addressed at the source. So one might ask why we haven't heard about process emissions before and now it's suddenly becoming one of our biggest challenges, right? Um, so as already mentioned, the water sector is a major energy um, use, 2% about 2% about of the UK electricity. So the majority of carbon emissions are related to energy use, but this has been changing over the past years. Um, and with water companies moving towards 100% of renewable energy, the proportion of emissions associated with energy use will be progressively shrinking, while scope one process emissions will make up the majority of the carbon footprint. So even though process emissions are currently a hotspot in the route map to net zero, with great uncertainty on how it is estimated and gap to filling in terms of monitoring UK specific treatment types, I still believe 
based on years of applied research on this area that it can also bring one of the greatest opportunities for industry-wide leadership in the form of innovation and collaboration with the supply chain and academia. And most importantly, uh, sharing the results and set an example to other countries. So that's how I wanted to open my first point with a pos positive tone of hope that as we look back in 10 years time, we can reflect on the fact that the water sector embraced the scale and magnitude of this challenge. And most impo importantly, we have to work together to mitigate these emissions in an inclusive and innovative approach. So why are process emissions a challenge? Um, so it's basically because of it's a complex biological system. So estimating greenhouse gas emissions from biological processes are not as straightforward as emissions from electricity or burning of fuel, uh, fossil fuels, where we know that the amount of greenhouse gas produced is a function of the carbon content of the fuel. With biological processes, and in the case of nitrous oxide, nitrification and denitrification, and we can see here some of the the pathways for production in secondary treatment. They are highly complex and they depend on the environmental and also operational conditions on which the treatment is carried out. So research developed the fundamental understanding on initial production from biological processes is an area of continued progress for almost three decades. And I'm glad to, to have done my master's and PhD research on this as well. But thanks to these, uh, decades of research. We now have a good uh, understanding about what are the main triggers for increased nitrous oxide production during wastewater treatment and how to address them. So it's good news. Uh, but as in all areas of science, we know that there are still gaps and it still remains an area of uh, further research. We also know that emissions are highly variable and we see here in these graphics below, a bit small, but spatial, diurnal, and seasonal variability because of the high complexity of the microbial system and dependence on the environmental and operational conditions. And that's the main reason why there is a huge uncertainty in how we estimate these emissions. There is a wide range of emission factor. And when I say emission factor, I'm talking about the unit that we use in terms of the percentage of nitrous oxide that is emitted per unit of nitrogen in the influent load. Um, so even for the same type of treatment, so same activate uh, sludge treatment type of treatment, we see that process, process emissions can be significantly different. And applying an average global emission factor, which is what we currently do using carbon account protocols, only incurs a high degree of uncertainty, as pointed out in the roadmap. And most importantly, we can do nothing about how to mitigate them. We, we know nothing about them in that case. Um, so in this case, for process emission, the solution is not one size fits all. It needs a focused approach to address production and emission at site level. And that takes me to my next point, which is the lack, oops, too much, <laughs> lack of understanding on uh, how the emissions are specific for a UK asset. Um, so I had the privilege of recently com completing the UOCRI project with water companies in which we review the best science available for process emissions and how to update the emission factor that we use in the carbon account workbook for both nitrous oxide and also methane. And some of these recommendations are highlighted on the route map. And as part of this work, we compiled a database of over 80 full scale monitoring studies that have been conducted on the road. And a couple of things became really clear. So most of the monitoring have been done with an academic perspective, not in the industry approach to mitigation with very few exceptions. So there is a big gap in how to address these emissions on site. The majority of emissions, the, the monitoring campaigns also were conducted in treatment types uh, that employ both nitrification and denitrification for total nitrogen removal and literature on N2O emissions from processes that are relevant to the UK, such as nitrifying only works, tricking filters and surface aerated surface 
uh, activated sludge plant is significantly limited. Even the most recent IPCC guidelines, which introduced the new emission factor and a methodology to consider site-specific monitoring and country-specific emission factors first, only consider emissions for, from the most widely used treatment processes globally. So as a result, there are no emission factors for trinket filters or surface aerated activated sludge processes. So the limitations presented with this new recommended emission factor by the IPCC, IPCC makes it less applicable to the UK water industry as well. So yes, more insight investigation at research level is required to improve our understanding of emissions from process relevant to, to the UK water industry to reduce our uncertainty of what the true emissions are from these processes. And that takes me to my next point, which is already there. <laughs> monitoring and in-country methodology. So the industry needs to develop a consistent framework to quantify and improve our understanding of emissions across a range of assets, including both suspended and attached growth assets. We know it will take time to fully investigate and understand the magnitude of these emissions. So we recommend at least one year long monitoring to cover the entire range of temperature and account for seasonality and this variability of N2 emissions and obtain reliable emission factors. And we recommend starting with lar the largest activated sludge plants, which treats most of the load and contribute to the majority of emissions in the country, while at the same time developing methodologies to quantify N2 and emissions from both surface aer uh, aerated ASPs and also drinking filters. And the industry could consider collaboration with other water industry research and utility partners for knowledge transfer to implement monitoring and reduction strategies. And a great example of these is Denmark. They have recently undertaken a voluntary national program involving full scale monitoring for over two years, covering about 30% of the Danish domestic wastewater load. And they use the results of these national wide monitoring to develop a new country specific emission factor. And many of the water utilities are already achieving a reduction of uh, up to 85% of nitrous oxide. Uh, and so the second phase of the Oakley project, which we are eagerly waiting for, will provide this initial approach uh, to process emission monitoring and it help provide evidence for best practice quantification and mitigation strategies that will help us achieve net zero. So my final point is our mitigation toolbox. So mitigation is possible. Good news, but only when we start measuring emissions. We know that mitigation is we know what are those mitigation strategies based on the main triggers for nitrous oxide production. And these are mostly related to changes in process control and optimization, and they are low to medium cost solutions. And although there is still significant gap in applying mitigation strategies in real time with data collection for a long period of time, we have seen reductions from 55 to 85% and also result in benefits of process performance and reduce operational cost. But because most of the research to date has focused on total nitrogen removal works, there is still a lack of understanding how to approach nitrification only works, fixed films such as trickle filters and surface area ASP. So this is an area that can be of leadership in, in the UK. And this toolbox for addressing N2 will likely include advanced data-driven tools such as machine learning, AI, and mechanic mechanistic models. And these will be tools to evaluate both mitigation strategies and reductions for larger sites, as well as for smaller, smaller sites where monitoring costs will be prohibitive. So to conclude, uh, to get to net zero, there is a role for everyone to play. The solution is all about collaboration, innovation, which will help inform global research and also provide the evidence that we need for future investment. So water companies, the supply chain, we, we all must work together with industry regulators to develop policy and funding frameworks required to facilitate this monitoring and mitigation to be implemented at scale in PR24. And again, to finish on a positive note, together we, we can overcome the challenge. And thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, so continuing the supply chain contribution to this session, we'll move on to uh, Mott McDonald, uh, Marari, sorry, Maria Manidaki, 
she is the global technical lead for Net Zero. We're responsible for a whole series of different projects around carbon management um, and part of the UK Net Zero Carbon Roadmap um, drafting, which is excellent. She's also a member of the UK Green Construction Board, the Infrastructure Working Group, and a visiting lecturer on uh, carbon and net zero at Cranfield University, as well as being a co-author for the Infrastructure Carbon Review for past 2080. So obviously a, a lot of experience to be able to contribute to, uh, to this particular uh, webinar. So with that, Maria, uh, welcome and uh, please continue. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, uh, for, for the invitation to speak. I mean, some great presentations. And I would like to really build on some of the messages from a supply chain perspective. Um, and when we're talking about supply chain, we're not just talking about the product material suppliers, but also tier one suppliers and perhaps touch upon in the, in the end uh, to the wider value chain, including regulation, government, etc. So bear with me. Um, so what I wanted to first uh, start with, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to go into too much detail. These are the hotspots that we've seen that uh, many people touched upon of where the main hotspots for operational emissions are in the UK water sector. And we clearly see electricity is there and process emissions are there and uh, burning of fossil fuels and transport. But uh, what I wanted to pause for a moment is um, one of the things uh, we keep uh, talking about is net zero and definitions and the carbon neutrality and carbon net zero and all these different kind of terminologies. If you think about it, I would like to keep things simple. And I would like to, to say that net zero is basically going to be an operating environment in the UK at least um, by 2050 that we all have to live in. Uh, in the water sector, we're talking about the 2030 timescale. And there are two main key components on this uh, in order for us to operate in this environment, being a water company, uh, being another asset owner, the wider value chain for infrastructure or any other economic activity. So on the left hand side, we're talking about, okay, so in this environment, in order for us to operate, we need to deliver the right thing, the right infrastructure. And this is all the different elements that our colleagues in the water companies and Water UK um, have, have been talking about. So what infrastructure do we need to plan for in order to help with this transition? You know, is it about renewables? Is it about um, um, alternative fuels, et cetera, et cetera? Is it about uh, how do we maximize opportunities in our existing land holdings and asset base to integrate that infrastructure, including carbon sequestration for land use change? And last but not least, let's not forget the right hand side, which is about we have huge capital programs going forward. So how about delivering them right with a net zero operating environment in mind? And this is more about understanding for the capital program that we have in, in the pipeline, basically, how can we look at it from a carbon lens to maximize opportunities to address all those hotspots that uh, we, we spoke about uh, from the previous presentations. And this is where things like past 2080 and the mentioned past 2080, you know, how the whole value chain for, for the water sector can align their objectives in order to get there. Another key message I would like to mention here is that um, we need to start thinking when it comes to, to, to addressing the net zero challenge of what different skills uh, we, we require to, to have in water companies, but the supply chain as well. So it's not just the traditional skills, technical skills that we needed to deliver assets, water and wastewater assets only. Now we're thinking about how do we, how a water company can actually become an energy provider or um, uh, electrifying their transport uh, operations or how do we go to the softer skills of digital or land sequestration and land use management so there are different dimensions to this and um, and finally what i wanted to to say in this uh, slide basically is that from what i've seen working with different asset owners water companies but also in other infrastructure sectors normally the people that uh, are dealing with each of the boxes yeah are in different departments and there are quite a lot of silos, not from an asset owner perspective, but from a supply chain perspective that we don't really talk to each other in order to make sure we integrate the delivering the right infrastructure and delivering our infrastructure right. So it's a piece about how do we make sure we address all the connections in the supply chain, but also in an asset owner. 
So what I want to give you now is very, very some quick practical examples, building on the themes that uh, our colleagues uh, in the previous presentations uh, mentioned about their own ambition and strategies and things going forward. So what can we do from a supply chain point of view to help with that transition? So when it comes to the hotspot of energy um, and uh, energy consumption, we talked about a lot about things. What about different technologies? Uh, Miranda very eloquently said from Scott's Water that you know we need to be really doing the boring stuff first, and then the 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 more attractive and technological innovations second. But when it comes to energy intensity, fundamentally, we're talking about we have done quite a lot of work in the water sector to do some pump pump pumping pumping optimization, site-specific power factor corrections, uh, the way we move our water, etc. But can we, as a supply chain, uh, select, for example, with some water companies, a couple of pilot catchment level projects being in wastewater networks or clean water networks or large treatment sites, where we actually try and, and see what performance data we have already in there, what infrastructure and assets like valves or other control systems we have in there, and how can we actually connect the customer end with the treatment end in order to see whether we can optimize things at catchment level. Um, and these are the more transformational measures that in the roadmap when we were looking um, at different uh, opportunities, this will be the things that will take us above the, the current five or 10% efficiency we're talking about. So anyone there in the supply chain that have some really good ideas, there are some pilots that have been done uh, elsewhere, like in Europe as well, but anyone who has those, those ideas it would be great to, to get in touch with uh, some of your, your clients in the water companies to test some of these concepts. The same applies with the risk-based wastewater treatment uh, management um, when we're talking about dealing with the large wastewater treatment works. Uh, is it worth pushing again and having more informed discussions with the real operational data with the regulators in order to see what are flexibilities in the specific catchment for a risk-based uh, and real-time wastewater treatment? Uh, I'm not going to go into too much on the process submissions because um, we had some excellent insights in the previous presentations, but these are the practical things we need to be really pushing and work in collaboration with, um, with the water companies and other stakeholders in, in, in that space. When it comes to renewable energy, and this is the decarbonization of electricity supply, um, we've heard a lot of great projects around solar, around wind, um, around uh, anaerobic digestion. Now, these are things that water companies have done some you know, excellent projects and we have things on the ground. Now it's about taking a step back and look at this from an energy company, if you like, energy generator uh, problem rather than a water company problem. So when it comes to, to implementing solar, wind or hydro or other renewables, it's now the, the matter of scale and how do we connect to the electricity grid, um, the, the low voltage grid basically. Um, is there anything we can do as a supply chain when we're planning for a new project to basically really understand the wider system to see what is the intermittency and what are the potential storage requirements, but also what strengthening needs to happen in the grid and whether we have the right locations for the right projects to implement. When we looked at the roadmap, we, we, we had quite a lot of heated debates um, with all our colleagues in the water companies about the practicality of perhaps even going up to 80% of um, the water sector's demand to be covered by renewables. How can this be done with things like uh, sleeving or with technical um, aspects integrating um, uh, with, uh, with a grid and how can we influence, for example, DNO's business plans to strengthen spe specific components of the grid that we need to, to benefit from as well. Um, the question of funding as well is important and that's why, um, and that's why it's important for the supply chain to look at alternative business models uh, to help companies fund these things. And okay, I'm sorry, I'm, the slide by slide is, I'm trying to. Uh, 
Okay, the same with transport. Yeah, so how can we actually, do you have any good technologies and ideas, especially on the HDV space where we can test things on biofuels, hydrogen, biomethane? Some other companies have already been doing that, but this is about how do we look, take a better look at the biogas, biomethane versus hydrogen balance that will come to the UK post 2030. Sorry, I'm just having a problem with the slides too to change them. And finally, on the nature-based solutions, I just wanted to say here, I'm not going to repeat what others have said because there are some excellent examples, but if you have any partnerships, any ideas with stakeholders at the catchment level that we can work in collaboration with, especially when it comes to better understanding the science behind the sequestration potential for things like peatland grassland restoration, and how do we create larger scale pilots to do that, then that would be great for the supply chain. What I wanted to end uh, on a note here is the importance. I'm really sorry, just that I'm struggling with it, with it, we changed the slide. What I wanted to, to, to finish off here is this is the infrastructure value chain and water companies fit into this asset owner bubble, the rest of the supply chain in those bubbles. It's about saying, how can we actually, in the capital programs we have to deliver, how can we work with the same objectives and align with that collaboration to really challenge the whole capital program in order to make this happen? So the, technology, the technologies are out there, but the question is, how do we make this business as usual going forward in AM7 and beyond? And that's it from me. I'm really sorry for the glitches in the slides, but uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you. No, thank you, Maria. That's, that's fine. Great. Thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to slightly different this is some of the industry bodies that are looking at this particular aspect as well. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dan. Um, Dan, uh, it works for Wessex Water. Uh, I think one of the important things that Dan does is he leads the big question for Aquir around carbon and, and, and the zero carbon approach that we need to do as the industry, which I think is great. Um, he's and Wessex for some time, uh, done a whole wide ranging uh, approach of uh, different activities, including biodiversity, renewable energy, compliance, contributions to the regulatory business plan, uh, which means it's well rounded for this type of discussion. Um, and, and I think that I'll just put my plug for Aquir, as I also happen to sit on the board of Aquir. Um, it, it really is sort of leading the way in terms of some of the big issues associated with the water industry uh, as a whole. Um, and this is one of the really big, important, big questions of the 13, I think there are now out there that everybody's focused on. So, so with that, um, Dan. Dan, oh, there you are. Hi, can, can you hear me okay? Because, um, uh, Andy, you were breaking up quite a lot in my feed just then. Oh, was I, can, was I, I can hear you now, yes. Great, okay, that, that's good to hear. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction, um, what I managed to catch of it, at least. Um, it's, uh, it's really good to join you all. Um, I'm just, I was just reflecting a second ago about what a privilege it is to really be working uh, in a community of people who are trying to leave this world in the best place. Um, uh, particularly in the context of such a pressing challenge as climate change and, and the need to decarbonize the, the, uh, an entire sector and indeed uh, an entire economy. So um, yeah, it, it's really good to be, uh, to be here talking on that theme. Um, hopefully you'll find my talk a bit repetitious. Um, normally that's uh, something that people try to avoid, but hopefully in this instance it shows that we're all thinking along similar lines, whether it's individual water companies or sector bodies such as Aquir uh, or uh, consultants, supply chain, others who are, who are stakeholders uh, to, uh, to the whole water system. Um, so yes, Aquir, um, for those of you who don't know the organization that well, um, it is uh, uh, an industry body that, that the water companies subscribe to and it assembles a research program um, to address uh, some common pressing uh, concerns that we're all trying to deal with. So let me just check. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a bit jumpy. Uh, I think uh, I just have to be careful. Yeah, one thing at a time. So um, I'll skip over the first few slides uh, because it sort of really reiterates some of the points that have been made 
earlier, but I think this one just shows that we're now at a, a sort of a critical mass point where where there's clear stated ambition from from different directions uh, within the sector that we really need to address carbon and get to this net zero position. Um, Sam covered the uh, the route map, which provides uh, the context um, for the uh, research program going forward uh, that uh, Aquir uh, is going to be uh, working on with uh, with the carbon theme. Um, current state of play: this is sort of uh, UK level. What's going on in the in the energy industry in uh, in vehicles? Most of you would be pretty familiar with all this stuff. Um, and then some specific points around process emissions, embodied carbon, which um, we've heard about already. And I'm going to touch on those in term, in the context of really um, the research gaps and the knowledge gaps that we need to be filling uh, in the next few years. So um, the Aquir big questions. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to, um, you yeah, know, my, my keyboard sort of likes to jump two at a time, I think. There are a number of big questions covering a whole range of topics, whether it's to do with customers, to do with uh, leakage, to do with um, sewerage, the water environment, plastics um, and resilience. Um, they're really covering the full spectrum of water company activities. And um, the way they're structured is that each one has a, a big audacious question at the centre. And then a number of outcomes uh, where that question is broken down into topic areas. And this is how we've structured the carbon big question. So how do we remove more than we emit by 2050? And that would cover supply chain carbon, capital carbon, however you want to call it. So getting to the point where we're net positive. Um, and it's broken down into these, these themes that uh, you'll be familiar with, we've already talked a bit about energy and transport and process emissions, a bit about embodied carbon in the investment and procurement side of things. Land use, um, I think someone mentioned uh, about the question of how much carbon, yes, in, in, in dual Cymru example, how much carbon can we sequester in our land holding and how can we maximise potential of doing that? Then looking um, uh, down the value chain towards our customers, can we influence the carbon footprint of our customers, particularly in the context of hot water use in the home, and then sort of cross-cutting tools and methods for managing the whole thing. So um, I'm going to look at uh, each of those individually, energy and transport. Um, it's certainly around electricity, that's been a preoccupation, um, but um, increasingly um, we're looking at heat. I do apologise, trying to trying to get this just to advance one slide at a time is proving tricky. Um, it doesn't want to land on that slide for some reason. So yeah, I'll talk around it. Electricity and heat, um, definitely on the on the uh, energy and transport side, how do we better integrate renewable energy into what we do as, as, a, as businesses and as sector? We've talked about the challenge of getting to potentially 80% self-generation uh, or, or consumption on average of our energy from renewable sources. Um, and I think with the research programme, um, if we're looking to fill knowledge gaps, is, is going to need to look, work quite closely with the supply chain, especially in areas like heavy goods vehicles, rather than just electrifying cars and vans, which is likely to be a process which happens uh, where, where market providers and the supply chain provide those solutions. Process emissions. Um, Ariane very helpfully teed this one up. And yes, we are doing this quantification work. Um, the, the next stage uh, is out for, uh, the adverts are out at the moment for expressions of interest, uh, where we're going to be taking one or two sites and um, installing sensors and software that will help us start to get a much more uh, site-specific uh, granular view of uh, emissions of nitrous oxide in particular from uh, wastewater assets and then start giving us better clues on how to uh, optimize those processes so we can limit uh, emissions without putting uh, the site at risk in terms of failing things like their ammonia concerns. Um, and I'm sure it'll be uh, the first stage would be real time monitoring and control before we think about very sort of investment heavy capital heavy solutions like covering uh, tanks and, and capturing gases, although that may follow in in the years ahead, but 
but that would be definitely much further down the line after I think we've exhausted optimization options. Uh, okay, so on the investment and procurement side, um, that's uh, yeah the embodied carbon side. I was having an interesting conversation yesterday uh, with a, a, a consultant talking about low carbon cement. Uh, we use huge quantities of cement and concrete, and there are products starting to come onto the market for uh, for reducing the, the embodied carbon there. So that'll be looking at use cases um, uh, because that's not a straightforward uh, question. So um, how do we best integrate those products into the market? Um, customers, hot water use in the home. What do customers think of offsets? This is uh, going to be an interesting one. Um, Sam talked about um, developing a UK-wide offsets market. Um, there are going to be a lot of UK-based companies wanting to be able to buy carbon offsets that have been generated in the UK. So the whole supply demand question is that is is a, a big interesting issue there. What would customers' tolerance be for offsets provided from overseas? And that's something that we need to test. These are all gaps in our knowledge, and um, hopefully, sort of combined research will help us with that. Um, I've talked, uh, and we've heard a bit about the the, the route map and sort of cross cutting tools. So I'll finish here. This is uh, in the the net zero carbon route map. Um, if you go towards the end of the report, uh, you'll start to see some of the sort of areas for innovation, emerging ideas, and these will be sort of relatively new items that will start to inform more and more our research program. The, um, the, the topics that we've identified aren't set in stone, they're indicative, um, but hopefully they provide a good guide as sorts of um, combined research work that we're going to need to do as a sector in order to find sort of common answers to these questions around how should we best manage our assets and the indeed the entire water cycle to make it a low carbon one uh, for the future. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm sure there'll be, well, there are already a couple of questions on Slido that we'll, we'll come back to in the Q&A. Uh, just to sort of say that if anybody's seen the group chat, um, we have started Slido again at the break, so uh, if, you, if you've got any questions from last time, particularly that I haven't remembered, or if you want to ask some new questions about the current um, set of panellists, then, then please do add those questions to Slido. Um, so we're going to go, walk up, go on to Water I, Water Wise, um, and I'd like to introduce Nikki Russell. Uh, Nikki's been the Managing Director of Water Wise since uh, 2017. Previously a director of Offwatt, so it might be interesting to see some of her views about whether the regulators are, are ready for, for this, but maybe that will come up in the questions. Um, she's led Offwatt's strategic approach in Wales and was involved in developing the 2019 price review um, for the and, and the retail market opening up in, in England. Um, I'm pleased to say that she's an honorary fellow of SIWEM um, and uh, she co-chairs Waterize Retailers Leadership Group for Water Efficiency, which I think is also an important point in reducing carbon. So with that, Nikki. Thanks, Andy. Brilliant. Uh, let me just check that I can make this work. There we go. Yay. Uh, morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about the role of water efficiency in reaching net zero. Um, and I was super excited that Dan had a whole slide about this because uh, I think most of the other speakers did mention it, but, but it wasn't uh, in their slides, but we didn't, didn't actually uh, get a chance to talk about it. So just a, a couple of words, a few words about WaterWise. Um, we are a UK-wide not-for-profit campaigning organisation. That's our vision, that water be used wisely every day, everywhere. That's our team. There are uh, seven of us. That was us at our Christmas ice skating almost exactly a year ago at Somerset House. Um, and these are the things we do. So we champion water efficiency. We support and challenge everyone. Um, and it's about sharing expertise, pollinating, influence and behaviour, helping water companies with their sort of technical retrofit programmes uh, and shaping policy and reg regulation. So hold on a minute while I move my pictures down so I can see my words. So what does net zero have to do with water wise and indeed with water efficiency? Um, so 
the very first speaker talked about how um, the sector represents, I think, 2% of the UK's electricity. If you look at total sort of water supply and use, it's around 5 to 6% of UK's total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and actually, the massive majority of that is about how we use water in the home. Uh, and in businesses for heating and washing. Uh, so the rest is for water companies supplying water and dealing with wastewater. I'm going to talk a bit in a minute about um, how that ties in with the route map. Um, but essentially, one of the things that we've worked out is that modest reductions in household water use of five to six percent uh, could deliver a bigger saving than was achieved in the whole of the, uh, the UK residential sector um, in the previous two years. So water efficiency um, is a double win. Waiting for my next slide, sorry. I'll stick to the arrows because they seem to do it immediately. So the net zero route map, our thoughts, we're hugely supportive of this uh, fantastic leadership from the UK water sector, recognise absolutely that it's groundbreaking. And we're very excited about it, like all of you on, on the call. Uh, and we're very pleased to see a demand led pathway because that actually wasn't in there at the uh, in the very early stages of discussions about net zero and when and how the water sector would reach it. So really pleased to see some stuff in there about obviously leakage, but also water efficiency. Um, so there's some of the hooks that are in there. Um, and as I mentioned just now, around 90% of carbon emissions from water come from how it's used rather than how it's supplied. So we think that that's clearly in scope of, uh, of scope three uh, carbon emission reductions. Um, so there's a, a point there about scale, which actually the one um, I made on the previous slide, you know, a, a reduction in household water use can make a huge, particularly on hot water, the less water you're wasting, the less water needs heating and also pumping and treating, so it impacts the sort of very industry specific bit as well, um, can make a huge impact on carbon emissions. Uh, businesses and local authorities have told us that they want this to be linked into their carbon programmes to help drive action on water. So, in theory, an open door there. So, what do we need to do? Uh, we, uh, and we're doing this at Waterwise, working with partners, we need to raise awareness of the role that water efficiency plays in carbon emissions and net zero. So we are starting to get traction on this, but um, it's, still, um, it's still a bit niche in some areas. We're really pleased that it's in the headlines. Uh, and that COP op is, is, is about, you know, the uh, events that the water sector plans around COP26 next year. Uh, let's include water efficiency in those and how we support, as Dan said, how we support customers and businesses and homes to reduce their demand, which helps with the carbon footprint, as well as the adaptation challenge, um, which you'll all be familiar with. So we need water efficiency to play a bigger role in all plans. And I did actually put something in the Slido chat and the Q&A for the first set of really interesting presentations about what's happening in a variety of different companies. So we've got these hooks in the route map, but how seriously is that being taken? What priority is it being given on the ground, sort of in the route map as a whole for the sector of Water UK and also for individual companies? Um, we know that all companies have got really good water efficiency programs now. We know that from our day job, but to what extent is there a link across between making those even more ambitious and using those to deliver carbon reductions. So we need a uh, third one, water sector to look at this and why not include it in the social contract because these are huge multiple benefits uh, driving water efficiency. It helps with adaptation, it helps with environmental protection, it helps with mitigation, helps reduce bills, water and energy bills. So it's a really big win-win-win um, all way round. Uh, let's include it in the social contracts that companies have and are developing. We need a mandatory water label. We almost got this um, and we're hoping that DEFRA are going to announce it um, next year. This has been a really big ask from the water efficiency community for many moons. Uh, and we did some research a couple of years ago, which showed that actually you wouldn't even need any behavior change. If you had a mandatory water label, for water using products linked to say product standards and building standards you could not actually knock 30 liters off the average per capita consumption of about 140 to 150 so let's do it why wouldn't we do it for energy um rainwater harvesting again ticks both boxes um and we need a, a net zero target for water for new large developments again we did some recent research that show that updated the cost benefit analysis um, for, for water neutrality and rainwater har harvesting and show that the, you know, it's a huge win-win again on, um, on the sud side as well as on the carbon and adaptation sides. 
So uh, it's all about people, right? At home and at work, it's how we use water. This is the point that I'm trying to get to, and Dan mentioned it too, about how we use water, uh, supporting all of us at home and at work to reduce our use. So very briefly on our campaign strategy as WaterWise, uh, this is an acknowledged uh, behaviour change um, approach and certainly there are loads of really brilliant awareness raising campaigns on water efficiency across the sector, but we haven't really tipped the balance into behaviour change. So this kind of build knowledge around the why, change attitudes and then help people to improve their practices is a standard behaviour change approach. We're building that into all of our campaigns at WaterWise uh, and we actually have something going on at UK level campaigns wise in every month of the year. Um, we've now decided that because um, the vast amount of business customers are actually using the same amount as domestic, if you think of a corner shop, if they're using, you know, taps, toilets, maybe showers, similar to a household. So all our messaging is going to target people at home and at work. Leaky loos will keep coming up. We want to keep up the consistent national messaging throughout the year. That's new for us. We appointed a new staff member to lead on this a year ago. We used to do water saving week in May, hugely successful, it always um, hit sort of three to 3.5 million people, but now we're doing something every month of the year. Uh, so this is our, uh, go and sign up, sign up now where you're listening to me, go to the WaterWise website, find Pledge 2021. Um, this is our new campaign, which we're linking to actual savings and it's along the lines of fee January um, and dry January. So basically if you sign up in December, you'll, you will get 28 daily emails in January, short emails, a short tip. And if you do all of them, you'll save way more than the 2021 liters, um, which gives the pledge and the year its name. And, and we're gonna be taking postcodes. So the water companies are really excited about this. We can pitch, you know, North against South, Wales against England, all that kind of thing. So do do sign up. And we uh, we had some really positive support from chief executives of the wholesale and retail companies as well on this. They're all signing up personally, which is great. So my closing thought, I have one more slide after this, um, a, dub, a double win. So 6% of UK emissions are from how we use water. And I could talk for hours about, uh, you'll probably all be familiar with the changes in, um, in demand patterns under COVID. Um, but, you know, let's harness those changes and use them as we go forward. Um, because a 5% reduction in household water use could, could lead to greater carbon reductions. And the total seen in the sector in the previous, each of the previous years, there's a stat there about business use and how much carbon that contributes. And double, double win, actually it's a double win, thanks Andy, on the mitigation and adaptation side. It also helps to cut energy and water bills. Um, so it would be madness not to factor it into net zero plans. We're really pleased that it's there at the strategic level. We really want to see it sort of bedding down into people's um, practical plans as they deliver it. So uh, thank you very much. That was one of our slides there from uh, the campaign we ran jointly with Water UK over the summer, Water's Worth Saving. Worth being a bit quicker, I always put that one in at the end in case I've taken too long on my slides. The hashtags are there, do sign up to the pledge uh, and remember water efficiency is essential to net zero, particularly um, as we work towards decarbonizing the grid, was mentioned right at the very beginning. Uh, thanks very much. I mute myself. The classic problem of the new way of working. Um, so thank you very much for that, Nikki. So we've now got a, a section on Q and A's, um, which, which I'll just look through with, with the panelists um, before I do a, do a wrap up. Um, the, the first question that sort of really came up and was quite popular in the first session was, um, what do we think the next step change in wastewater treatment technology is, in order to get to a, a low carbon treatment process? And I thought that might be quite a good one for Ariane to, uh, to respond to. Sure, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question, really good. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of new technologies that are increasing attention and have been implemented here in the UK and globally. And some of them are, they are m low carbon because they require less footprint and also less energy. So they're less energy intensive. But on the other hand, some of these technologies might actually increase nitrous oxide and methane. And these are aerobic granulized sludge. Um, and there has been some of the implementations here in the UK. And a few studies have been done around nitrous oxide from lab and pilot scale, not from full scale anymore. And emissions of nitrous oxide has actually been 
uh, double of what we see from suspended activated sludge. So more studies needs, needs to be done to actually understand the impact on process emissions from aerobic granulized sludge. There's also anaerobic treatments such as uh, UASB and also anaerobic membrane bioreactors. And as an aerobic technology, you don't need to put on air oxygen. So it's expected to, to have much lower um, energy requirement, but at the same time, it can also increase methane fugitive emissions. Um, so that's another thing to, to think through. And I think the last one, it's membrane irated bioreactors, MABR, and it's a unique attached growth system. It's different um, type of direction on the, on the biofilm. And this one actually has seen lower emissions of process um, and it requires lower footprint and also lower energy requirements. So from all of these three um, up and coming new technologies for low carbon, I would say that membrane aerated bioreactor might be a really good option uh, for both energy uh, reduction, emissions from energy reduction and also from process emissions. Hope that answers. Great, thank you. Uh, one, one of the questions that's come up in the second tier is, is how are water companies and tier one contractors collaborating to bring forward innovation available from typically smaller, more agile companies who may otherwise find it difficult to market and make headway into? Um, I think that's a great one for Maria following her sort of um, her, her chain of influence from water companies down. So Maria, I don't know if you want to go for your comments on that. Yeah, thank you, Andy. So from, from what I've seen that works best in practice on this is um, basically to not break the link between the SMEs and the smaller suppliers with the water companies directly, even if those smaller companies are part of the supply chain of tier one contractors or consultants. So I, I really emphasize the need for water companies to keep engaging with the supply chain at a more strategic level through supply chain forums, through setting specific challenges. And I think it's important for the water companies to clearly articulate what the problems they're facing in those focused challenges, challenge sessions, so that both smaller suppliers and tier one suppliers can engage directly. We have to move away from just a supplier waiting uh, for an opportunity to be advertised to, to do something about it and more about knocking on the door of different companies being the tier one suppliers or the companies themselves, but they need a route to do that. So that's why I think it's so important for water companies to strategically engage with the supply chain. Can I um, add something to that one, please? Please do. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, this is something that the water companies have been very conscious of. Um, and, and I think we have made some headway in there um, and there's going to be a whole lot more progress in the next couple of years, hopefully. Um, you've got the Offworld Innovation Competition, which uh, some of that is based around headline themes. And we're going to be looking at how challenges can be used as well. Um, uh, and there's a, there's really um, a, a strong current in that, um, and also in the in the UK water innovation uh, strategy that we um, can and should get involved with a much wider range of potential solution providers, um, and uh, and not just work with the usual suspects as good as many of them are, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we need to be a bit more creative and expansive in terms of who we involve. Um, and for a, for a personal perspective at Wessex Water, we've been doing that through the Wessex Water Marketplace, um, a, an online platform where we uh, place some, some problem statements. And we've had some really interesting uh, responses um, to some of those from, quarter, from, from companies that we'd have never encountered normally. So there are ways and means of doing that, and there's some progress uh, underway. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, there's a specific question here, which I might just widen to a little bit further, which is have WaterWise looked at composting toilets at all in terms of waterless? And I think that sort of widens into um, domestic you capture and use of water to really reduce the amount of water that's being taken from the supply chain. So, Nikki, I wondered if you could just comment on what WaterWise have looked at at the household level and where that might be developing. Yeah, so at WaterWise, we haven't looked specifically at composting toilets, but we do spend a huge amount of our time talking about and looking at toilets. Um, so just two points. The first one is, um, well, three actually. 
toilet use used to be the biggest um, user of household water and now in recent years it's switched to personal washing. So those patterns are really interesting. Part of the solution to that was fuel flush. That leads me to my second point, which is that leaky loos are a really terrible problem and almost waste. Uh, it's that some dual flush loos uh, constantly leak down the bottom of the pan and that wastes almost as much water as dual flush loos were supposed to save. Um, and the final point is that we've done um, quite a lot of work on recycling, including on customer perceptions of it. So water recycling, you know, using grey water to flush your toilet. People are way more relaxed about that now than they, they were when the last research was done sort of 10, 20 years ago. So there's just some, some toilet snippets there. But the short answer is we haven't done anything on composting toilets yet. Okay, thank you. Um, there's, there's been a number of sort of ideas, which are essentially questions. Um, so Dan, I wonder if this is something that you might be able to comment on in terms of, do we need to minimize the impact of storm overflows from sewage treatment networks and the carbon impact of managing surface water and how it can be reduced and whether that's been part of the big question in any way? Um, one of the other big questions is around uh, unintentional releases of sewage into the environment. And so um, that one would be dealt with um, really through, through that one. I think that's principally around sort of concerns about impacts on the environment and public health potentially with this sort of the increase in interest in inland bathing waters for example um but yeah if you take a wider sort of systemic view um with the impacts of climate change likely to bring about wetter winters and uh, more extreme rainfall events happening on a on a more frequent basis um how do we make sure that our water infrastructure is both able to cope with those sort of future pressures, but that we don't rely on very, very carbon intensive solutions, just sort of build our way out of trouble. Um, if it's a question of capacity, for example. Um, so, and of course that then points to a whole panoply of issues around land use, the planning system, um, about uh, how we have the, think of the land water interface, there's something where you're not just trying to move water off the land as fast as possible, which has tended to be the paradigm, but how you sort of increase the absorbency of, of both rural land and urban land. Um, and it's clearly an area where, where water utilities um, have a part to play, but obviously in, in concert with uh, local authorities, with uh, developers and others. So it's, uh, it's very multifactorial, but yeah, the, 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 the sort of the carbon the whole life carbon view of solutions is definitely one that's going to need to be factored in. Great, thank you. Um, Nikki, another one for you, I think, and this is going to be a little bit interesting. It's about customers um, in many parts of the country are happy to pay for carbon um, and so, so carbon offsetting, should I say, and you see that in your energy bills and if you want to take a flight and all those types of things, you get the option. Um, do you think customers would want to see and do you think there's a mechanism that we should be looking at providing this as an option for customers to pay a little bit more in future to offset their carbon? Uh, I mean, a get, short answer, yes. I think it's a really interesting point. We, we are working really hard to help customers to understand A, how much they use and B, the value of water to their everyday lives. So in the same way that we're asking to factor water into the energy debate, we should absolutely be, be bringing that into the, the water debate. And some companies are, are offering sort of water offset schemes to their customers and saying, you know, if you as a community save X amount, you, could, you can either get some money back or you can choose to donate it to water aid or to a local charity or whatever. So we should certainly be, be including carbon offsets. And I actually made a note from Dan's point that um, to talk to the team about that, um, because we talk about increasing the value of water to help drive water efficiency, the knowledge of the value of water. But Dan's point was also about um, the carbon, building carbon knowledge. So I think we should definitely be combining the two. And also not just for household customers, but for business customers too, where there's an absolutely clear price driver and link between the two. There's a there's a really interesting tension here, because on the on the one hand, um, a couple of people said I agree. Sorry, Dan, we're struggling to pick you up at the moment. Could you turn your camera off, Dan, and say it again? I'll, um, 
in in the meantime, I'm sure Dan can add that to a comment in the uh, in the Slido. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to an, another question. I think it's probably for uh, Ariana to to answer this again. Or I am sorry. Um, based on the fact your your presentation about nitrous oxide is enclosure now unavoidable to manage residual uh, nitrous oxide release. Sorry, can I repeat the question? Is, um, is enclosure associated with um, wastewater treatment technologies? Um, is that now unavoidable in terms of preventing nitrous oxide release? Mm, um, not necessarily, I would say. Um, yeah, having closure, you can actually, uh, be, it would be much easier to capture that emission. Um, there is also opportunity for additional removal. So for instance, through biological denitrification through bioscrubbers or airlift bioreactors as well. So it does add an additional um, step that can help plants that don't do denitrification to actually remove that. Um, but the, you have to think about also the carbon intensity of closing all the big tanks, all the aeration lines uh, to actually just contain that um, emission. So I would say that it's better to look at how to mitigate during process optimi optimizations than to actually add another piece of concrete um, to to enclose those um, those tanks. Okay, thank you. Um, one one more question. I think we've uh, we've got here, um, and maybe this is actually for Matt. If he's still on. Uh, there's a, there's a question about um, with with this being such a significant issue going forward. Should we be moving away from anaerobic treatment of our sludge and look at managing um, process submissions in a different way? which I know is relevant to biomethane and those types of aspects. Uh, thanks, Andy. So um, treating our sludge with, with AD is obviously one of the ways that we, at the moment, uh, do, do a couple of things really effectively. We um, release the methane in a controlled environment and we can capture it. Um, uh, we also treat the sludge so that we put onto fields um, and, and dewater it effectively so there's less volume. So there's a lot of really good reasons why we do um, anaerobic digestion. Um, uh, Thames in the past uh, did, <laughs> once upon a time, we just sent it out to sea and dumped it at sea. The, the, the days are long gone there. Um, uh, as an interim solution at our big Beckton cross nest sites in uh, East London, we put incinerators in and we incinerate raw sludge. Um, that's a far worse carbon um, uh, solution than AD. Uh, it releases nitrous oxide emissions and all sorts of other things. Um, uh, so the uh, AD is really where we're looking at the moment because it gives us that controlled release of methane in the digester where we can then usefully use the methane um, in a multitude of ways afterwards. So actually I see it as a really great enabler to, to kind of help decarbonize uh, the, the industry. Great, thank you. Um, so we've sort of come to the end of our, our Q&A position what I'll uh, please ask the panelists is to still sort of look at the uh, the slido questions and ideas actually on both of those two sections and and reply because there's some individually and there's it will generate a good discussion across the board and slido is going to be uh, uh, left open for a while at least a week so people can continue to ask questions and respond as required on this because obviously generated a lot of questions and thoughts that are more than we have time for uh, today so just really to, to sum up what we've uh, what we've seen today, um, we started with, with with Sam talking about the route map, which is obviously a, a great thing to take as the industry and uh, emphasising the fact that that needs to be built down into um, really driving the individual company plans and what we are actually going to do to achieve that. Um, and that will be a, an interesting next stage in July when, when all the companies start uh, producing and, and elevating some of those issues. And then we had the four water companies that discussed exactly what they're doing now, uh, some different approaches you know, from being completely flat to being completely hilly and some of the different um, ways that the different water companies are going to have to address the particular issues that we, we all have. Um, I don't think there's ever going to be one size fits all. We all have our own little um, issues along board, but sharing some of the information will be really important. 
know, Mott and Jacobs contributed in terms of uh, where the supply chain can help, how we can integrate the supply chain all the way through, um, but also in terms of some of the technologies that we need to look, look at to improve and reduce some of our process emissions. And there's no doubt that this is going to be a whole industry question. It's not just the water companies and it's, and it's not just the innovators that are going to solve this. It is going to be, have to be collaborative across the board. Um, and then uh, Dan offered where we're going with Aquir and some of the research stuff. And I think it is really worth clicking on, on some of those links to be able to see where we're going and contributing as well to where that, that, the, the whole research debate is going. And there's obviously the innovation fund that is also being kicked off next year, which uh, the more ideas and the, the more approaches that we can take into place there, the better it will be overall. And then a, a, a slightly different, almost customer view through Nikki and Waterwise in terms of how we can reduce water to begin with. Um, and I know that's a, a key issue, both in terms of the uh, per capita consumption target that we all have through Offwat now and the performance commitment around that but also around suds and, and managing water going out and uh, new, new works, all those types of issues around there. So I think it's been a good and wide ranging debate. I hope people have, uh, have thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it's certainly been very interesting to be able to see where we've been going and what we've been doing. Um, I'd like to thank all our speakers uh, on, on behalf of Cywem, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's actually probably more difficult to stick to 10 minutes than it is to have half an hour sometimes in terms of making sure that we get those, those questions out and the key points out. So thank you for all your time and effort to be able to present here. And I hope you've also got some things out of it and some new contacts through Slido and, and the various other approaches we're doing. Also like to thank the Cywem events team who without we wouldn't be able to sort of put these things on. And it's great that we've had so many people across the board to be able to, to do this. Um, obviously, WRC, um, WRC uh, under new ownership. Um, it, it's great that they're sort of sponsoring these types of events because it allows us all to be able to sort of share knowledge. Um, and, and these things do take a little bit of time and effort to put into place. So sponsorship is, is really important. So it's, it's great that that's been there. So I'd like to thank them as well. Um, just to say, you know, uh, coming back to the COP26 approach that is happening. Uh, COP26 is still going to go ahead next year, we hope. There's going to be a whole load of supporting um, uh, events and venues, some of them virtue, some of them around that support that. I'd like to call out two. There's going to be one on the, the 19th of January, which is about water efficiency and metering, which I think is a good extension from what we were talking about here and, and, and Nikki's comments and takes us into the next level of detail around that issue. Um, and then on the 26th of February, there's the best practice in adapting and reporting um, around some, some of the natural capital solutions that we need to look at to be able to achieve this. So I think that's going to be another, another great event in terms of taking those forward. So um, thank you for this morning. Uh, I think we've just about done it within the time scales that we said we were going to do. Uh, please do continue with um, the Slido and give us some feedback forms which will apply to the next set of these webinars. Uh, I wish everybody a, a happy and safe Christmas. Um, I think everybody's going to be looking forward to a break this year with what's been happening. Um, and as, as Boris said, I suppose everybody's looking for a merry little Christmas at the moment. Um, and so with that, happy Christmas. Thank you for your time. Hope you've enjoyed it and we can all catch up and speak soon. Thank you very much.